been a good day. Thank you for the great lunch and everything. And um, just thank you for your prayers for us and your kindness. And uh, I, uh, we've just been blown away by your, your love for us this week, and we're thankful. And uh, like, like I said this morning, uh, we're going to continue to pray, as I know you are, and uh, we'll just do what the Lord wants. Well, let's go First Thessalonians chapter 1. And again, we're going to just finish uh, the message from this morning, really. Looking at this church in Thessalonica, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. But before that, let's read our text. Let's just start in verse 1, chapter 1. Uh, it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And, and here's our, our key verse for this afternoon. Uh, remembering without ceasing, there's three elements here to this church, your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Dear Lord, we ask tonight, this afternoon rather, that you'd speak to our hearts through your word. And uh, Lord, we, we just pray, and I know in a Sunday afternoon service that we can fight uh, being tired and uh, we can uh, kind of be looking, uh, looking on to the rest of the day. But Lord, you've called us here together. We believe by your will and design, we're here together to, to learn from your word. And so we pray that you would use your word in our lives. And uh, Lord, do whatever is necessary in our hearts so that you may draw us closer to yourself. And Lord, we'll thank you for all you do. I pray for your help and ask for your help in the preaching. And we'll ask for that help in Jesus' name. Amen. So just remember that this church was started out of uh, persecution. So Paul went to Thessalonica. He was there just a very short time. He got the church up and going. Some converts were one to the Lord, baptized. He assembled them quickly into a church. He stayed with them night and day, uh, praying with them, teaching them, admonishing them. And then he had to go because of persecution. And he went on down to Berea and then on through Iconia and, and finished up his missionary journey. Later, he sent back Timothy to check on the church because... It had been started under such difficult times, and he wanted to check and make sure that they were doing okay. And in chapter 3, we find the report from Timothy, uh, where Timothy came back, and, and I mean, they were doing so well. Um, they were standing fast in the Lord, even though they were in, a, in an area that didn't like them, and didn't like that they were standing fast in the Lord, and they were under persecution. And, and you remember out of Acts, we won't go there for sake of time this afternoon, but in the book of Acts, they, they even hired, uh, you know, lewd fellows of the baser sword, I believe is what it says. And so they hired some uh, knuckleheads with clubs, you know, you might say, to go and, and persecute the church. And that's exactly what they did. And, and uh, so they're having to battle all these things. But, but Paul was concerned, are you standing in the faith? Are you, are you grounded? Are you settled? Are you unmoved? Is the gospel still going out? And Timothy came back saying um, all of those things and more that, that their message had permeated the area and that they were persistent. They were staying uh, true to the gospel. And so he was very glad for the report. And, and he lists out in chapter three. So, so Timothy would have come back before he wrote this letter because we have in chapter three where he's been writing the letter, explaining this to them. So this is sometime later now. And he's explaining to them why he is so thankful for their work. And I believe what sets apart this church in Thessalonica from maybe other church or other works that we could look at in the scriptures. And one good one to compare is, um, is uh, the church at Ephesus. So go over to Revelation 2. And I just want to show you this. We didn't do this this morning because I knew I would probably just go over here tonight just by way of review. But in, in Revelation chapter 2, John is writing a letter through inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the churches. Um, and uh, one of the churches is the church of Ephesus. And I just want you to see this, that um, this church in, at Ephesus has the very same, well, it has similar characteristics to that of the church in Thessalonica. Uh, and by the way, the church at Ephesus was a good church. Um, it's one of the churches in, in the book that gets both some commendation and some condemnation. Uh, so there's one thing that, that the Lord admonished them on, but they were doing some things right. Chapter 2, verse 1, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. By the way, that's the Lord Jesus Christ is identified in chapter 1. Look at what it says. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And how that thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Um, but look at verse number, number uh, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first 
love. So this church in Ephesus, they had works, they had labor, and they had patience. But what we find is that there's something missing in the formula, there's something missing in, the, in, in, their, in, in the, the Bible there would refer to it as they had left their uh, first love. And so there's something left out of the mixture. So now go back to 1 Thessalonians. And this morning we looked at how our work, and we're saying this, the, the total work of the ministry, what we would call the work or uh, the work of the church. And again, we, it, we know that it's made up of all these singular efforts of the different people of the church. And so uh, right now, I assume there's ladies in the nursery uh, helping with uh, watching Screaming Kids. And I'll tell you this, I'm so glad that they are there doing that because I would not trade places with them uh, tonight if you asked me to. I, 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 that is a ministry, not only to those children, it's a ministry to the adults that are sitting out here and able to enjoy a service and listen to the, the, the word because they're doing that. So again, Th that is a work. That's part of the work of the church. And so when we add up all the collective works of the church, we just sort of call it the work. And this morning, the admonition from the scripture is that our work would be a work of faith. We do these things. You know, I I'll get up and preach a message because I believe that the Bible can change a life. I believe that the scripture can have an effect on the heart and can change our behaviors and can change our actions and can and do what the scriptures tells us it can do, which is to mold us and make us into the person or a person more like Jesus Christ. And so, uh, again, that why do we do what we do? Well, hopefully it's because we believe God can do something with what we're doing. So tonight then or this afternoon, I'm going to say tonight over and over and over, but you know what I mean. This afternoon. We're going to look at the last two pieces of the puzzle. So the labor of love. So labor is, it sounds very similar to work, and it is, but labor is, is a little bit different in the scriptures. In fact, for you ladies, you know that labor, uh, you know what labor is all about. Um, labor involves pain. Uh, labor involves struggle. And so labor is work that is, that is defined just a little differently. And so um, never had any babies, I'll admit to that. And so I, I wouldn't even compare what I've been through to any, I'm, I'm smarter than that, to any sort of childbirth scenario. Um, but I'll tell you, I've had some jobs in the past where it was very, it wasn't just work, it was labor intensive. And one of the, the jobs I had uh, growing up was framing houses. And when you're framing houses and you don't know about what you're doing right away, um, guess what you get to do? You get to carry large pieces of lumber from one end of the yard to the other. And when you get those pieces of lumber moved from that end to the other, you usually have to move them back where you started. And you just sort of do that all day. And I just remember the labor involved in framing a house. I remember going home and uh, after a few months, you get you, you learn things and you pick up some skills and, and you get to do more than just move boards around. And I'll, I'll never forget going home. And every time I close my eyes, seeing my hammer swinging. You know, you close your eyes and you just, you still see that this repetitive motion you've done all day, nailing rafters up. And so you're just, you just see that hammer swing. You can just feel your forearm. You know, you can't hardly grip, you know, even the remote control after a, a long day's work because you've worked so hard. And, and so that was one, one job that just, it just involved a lot of pain. And I worked for uh, my cousin's granddad and he, he was not the type to care too much about your pain. He was just one of those bosses that he, he couldn't care less, in fact. And so, uh, anyway, that was a difficult job. And, and then I worked in a, a cottonseed factory, a cottonseed plant. It's not a factory. We don't make the cottonseed, you know, but you do process it. And I worked in a plant. And I remember just, just stacking cottonseed bags all day, just making pallets of cottonseed all day. 50 pound bags coming off of there and just stacking them up. And you put 50, 50 bags on a pallet or 35 bags, whatever it was. And then you go to the next and just all day, just constantly working. Very monotonous. Over and over, same thing, but that sort of, that, that's the idea of labor. It, it's this monotonous and intensive work that has an element of pain and suffering. So you all know, you've all had uh, maybe things in, in your life that you would consider labor. The word labor there in the scripture, it means a beating. You ever worked so hard and you thought, man, I just took a beating today. Yeah, that's the idea of labor. You might think of being out in the heat you know, and just, in, just intense work, united with trouble, pain, toil, uh, weariness, all these words are in the, in the concordance. So basically labor is working to the point of what you would say, man, that was a beat down. If there's not an element of suffering, well, we, we shouldn't probably call it labor. So labor is something that you do. And at the end of the day, your feet hurt and you're tired and your back hurts and, you, and, you're, and you're ready to sit down because you've persisted through the challenges of the day and so we've all been there. And, and I'm just telling you, sometimes 
in the ministry, a lot of times in the ministry, it requires labor. So more than just a work, it, it requires labor. There's been a lot of days in the ministry where I've gone home and I'm just completely exhausted. You know, your back hurt, your feet hurt, everything else. But here's the thing. It's not just a physical thing in the ministry or in the spiritual realm. Many times it's not just tasking on the body, but the ministry is, is tasking on the emotion and, and, on the, and on the intellect. And just so physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually, as we serve and work, we get drained in these different areas. And, and that is what constitutes labor. So when we get saved, Jesus said a few times uh, to various people who came to him and they wanted to know, you know, what was the secret to eternal life and so on and so forth. And again, I'm kind of paraphrasing. There's a couple of examples of that. And it's interesting that the Lord did every time he, he encouraged them to count the cost of following Christ, because it does have a cost. Now, it doesn't cost anything for salvation. Don't get me wrong. It's not that we pay or we do some sort of works or we, we so some sort of makes make our way of salvation. That's all I'm talking about. But following the Lord and being his disciple, it, it will cost us something. There are going to be times of struggle. There are going to be times of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual draining. There'll be times where it's laborsome. So why would we put ourselves through that? I and mean, why do that? No one in here likes that. If, if I ask you, hey, you want to go stack hay all day? You know, you'd go, not really. I mean, I've got a lot of better things I could do with my time. We don't really like that. But I'm telling you, a church needs to be a laboring church. We need to be willing to, to work ourselves to tired if that's what needs to be done that day for the Lord. Um, here's the important part. Because we can, it's just like I said this morning, and some of this is repeat, and I'm sorry about that. But, you know, um, we can get to where we just do the work, just in the routine. It's just what I do. I wake up, I, you know, I come to church. Hopefully you comb your hair first, you come to church, teach the kids, you sit in the pew, you give, you do whatever. It can get to where it's just something you do. And so we've got to not forget the important elements of each one of these things. So we said that this morning it's important in our work to have a work of faith. We believe God's going to do something. Here we need to have a labor that is motivated uh, through love. Notice it says a labor of Love. Why would we put ourselves through the turmoil of the ministry? Well, it is because of love. That is the key ingredient, and it cannot be left out. Um, Jesus came to this earth and put himself through a whole lot of turmoil, a whole lot of turmoil. You realize he, he had everything he needed in heaven. He did not need us, and, and he was completely sufficient in and of himself. He had zero reason uh, to come to this earth other than, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So his motivation was love. He came here uh, in a sin sick world. I mean, you, could you imagine the disgust of the savior showing up to his creation all out of sorts and sinful? And, and, and I mean, I just, I mean, imagine the, the story of the gospel. And if you read at the end of the gospels where you're, you're reading about his crucifixion, I mean, these are the people that are pulling out his beard and spitting on him. And, and, and he knows, he knows as he's walking to, to the cross, he knows all the sin in their life. And all the sin that's in their life is going on that cross. And he's working his way up to the cross. He did that, the Bible says, because of love. And I'm going to tell you, I don't understand why God loved me so much. I really don't. Why would he do that for us? Well, it's because of his love. Notice Paul gives this church an example of this in his own ministry to them. Notice over in 1 Thessalonians, just look over to chapter number 2 and look at verse number 7. Notice Paul's behavior toward this church. Why would he go to a bunch of unbelieving Jews and preach the gospel and, and nearly get beat up and run out, and he did get run out of town? Why would he put himself through that? It was a motivation of love. Look at verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So, so Paul came into the, these people in a gentle manner. And, and it gives us the example of as a nurse cherishing her children. Now, there's nothing more loving and gentle than that. Verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, he's expressing his love. Here's why we did it. We did it because we love you. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, he says this, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. You know that Paul said, I'm willing to give you the gospel. Paul also said, I'm willing to give you me. 
I, I was willing to be spent for, for, for the Lord's glory in, in your presence because I loved you. Notice what it says, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring, here's that word again, laboring, night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. And so Paul gives them an example of what it means uh, to labor. So this idea of being affectionately desirous of someone, consider what a mom goes through when they have a baby. Um, I remember that first two weeks was just terrible for me. I couldn't sleep. Baby's crying. Y'all, yeah, okay, thank you. Somebody, I'm like, yeah. The moms in the room should have thrown tomatoes, okay? Because <laughs> the first two weeks are rough for dad, but then who's staying up with the kids after that? How does any child survive? I mean, seriously, it's brutal. They don't sleep. You, you, they sleep when you're at work so that when you get home and you're tired, they're ready to, to go and they're hungry and they, you got to change their diaper. And, and I mean, I just, how do any kids survive? Well, as a nurse, cherisheth, that's love, her children. It's just love. And so that's the motivation. So Paul is saying in our labor, why would we put ourselves through difficulty and why would we work so hard that we would be tired and labor for the Lord? Well, it's because we love. We love our families. We love the lost. We love the church. We love the brethren. We love the ministry. More than that, though, we love Jesus Christ. We don't love him because we're love. We love him because he's love and he first loved us. Paul says over in 2 Corinthians, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now there's something important in these verses because Paul is saying we serve the Lord because we love the Lord. But then he goes on to say, but really we love the Lord because he first loved us. And, and we serve him because he was, he thought it was, we were worthy of his labor. You say, I, I'm not worthy. Guess what? This, this thing about um, what something is worth. All right. So different things are worth different amounts to different people. Okay. Um, I was in, uh, did, did some real estate classes. And so they would say, a, a, a real a property is worth, you know what a property is worth? I'll tell you. Yeah, whatever someone will pay. That's what it's worth. You say, well, how do I put a price tag on this? Well, it's whatever someone will pay. It's worth that. So you may look and say, boy, I wouldn't pay for that. But if someone else paid for it, then it was worth that to them. So different people pay uh, more for different things. Um, I uh, tried to think of a few examples, but you know, it's really hard to do without making everybody mad because we all disagree on, on stuff. And, uh, and so, but we all ascribe different values to things. Um, some of us guys, you know, uh, like myself, I'll wear the same t-shirt for 14 years because I don't want to go buy another, another t-shirt. You know, I mean, it, it's got holes in it. You can read the newspaper through it and all that. I don't care. It still fits. I like it. It's comfortable. My wife will throw it out. But then really, truly, I'm the spender in our household. And, and, uh, so I, she, she, I don't get away with much around there because I'm always spending the money. But things are worth different. So some people would just think it was unbelievably just a huge waste of money to go down to the coffee shop and pay five bucks for a cup of coffee. Who are my people in here? Okay, so yeah, I'm not trying to cause problems. I'm really not. Okay, just a waste of money. It's, it's water that they poured over beans. Okay, but who are those? Who are those people in here that will gladly pay for a high quality cup of coffee, four or five bucks? I'm with you. Yeah, I'm one of them because I, I have an addiction. I'm Jeremy Gilbert. I am addicted to coffee. Yes. See, some people think, man, you are crazy. Five bucks for a cup of coffee. And you're like, yeah, but have you tasted it? It's better than what you can make at home. I'm just telling you. No, I like my Folgers. Okay, good. You drink that, you know. And by the way, I'll drink that too. Not, but I'm not above that. You know, a guy will go spend thousands, hundreds. Let's go hundreds. I don't get everybody in trouble. Um, 
Oh, no. I, let me get somebody in trouble. I, I have a friend who spent $4,000 on a rifle scope. And all the ladies in here. Oh, my goodness. What a way. All the guys in here. What kind of scope was that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sounds like a good scope, you know. You know, in Texas, we hunt hogs at night. And you got to have thermal, you know, it's, and so it just gets expensive. Um, you know, and then a, a lady will buy, again, I'm not trying, to, you know, I, we try to bring families together, not separate. <laughs> but um, a lady will spend two or $300 on a bag. And us guys are going, what? Why would you spend that much on a purse, you know? Let me put my stuff in it. <laughs> um, we ascribe different value. That, that's this idea of what, what something's worth. And I'm being funny, but listen. You know what you were worth to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand what you were worth? You were worth God in heaven taking on this sin. I mean, he, wasn't, he didn't take on sinful flesh. He was not sinful, but he took on flesh. He didn't have to do that. He, he came to this earth and, and he walked around on this planet for 33 years as a man. And, and walked among us and dealt with our heartache and our sorrow and our hunger and our cold. And, and, and all the while, that, that's, that's hard enough, but all the while then knowing at the end of that, that this creation that he spoke into existence would walk him up a mountain and crucify him. He gave his body on the cross. I mean, literally gave his life in my place and your place. I mean, the pain of the cross, we could talk about it, but, but the separation from the Father. Someone who had never known sin, becoming sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, so that I could be made righteous. I'm the one that put him there. You know why I did that? That's what you and I are worth to Jesus. That's what we're worth to Him. So flip that around now. Labor. Working hard for the Lord to the point where we're tired, you know. What are you, what are you willing to give for the Lord? What's He worth to you? What sort of investment would you be willing to make for the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I say this? There's nothing in this world that the Lord could ask of me that would be unreasonable. He's He's given everything for me. So, labor. Of love, we we labor because we love. Now, I, I want to say more. We got to go on patience of hope. Look at this next one, Ver, verse three. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Secondly, and labor of love. Thirdly, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, going to get in a lot of trouble talking about patience because nobody's patient. We don't like patience. We don't even like the word, and um, we're constantly told, "Don't pray for patience." You know why? We know how to get patient. <laughs> going through things. We're not a patient society. You know, we, we want things now. Um, I said this this morning, I'm always irritated when, you know, I have to wait and I get held up, but we're, we live in an instant gratification society. You know, um, we, you know, there's microwaves and fast food and, you know, that kind of stuff because we can't wait. So I want to, work on our patience a little bit because we we spend a lot of time as Christians waiting. We wait maybe on an answered prayer. You know, anybody in here, and you, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think in your own life, when you've prayed for something and 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 you think, the Lord, are you hearing me? You know, are you going to answer this prayer? And, and maybe it's someone that we know that needs to get saved. You're praying for their salvation year in and year out, waiting. We don't like waiting. Some folks have gone through some physical trial, maybe um, some ailment, or, or they're waiting on a, a test results to come back. Oh, we don't like waiting. Some have worked in the same position for many years and worked hard and, and been a good employee, and they're waiting for that promotion, waiting for the raise. Just fill in the blank. We don't like, we don't like waiting. And as Christians, I think, I think we can get frustrated at times because we're waiting on the Lord to come. We're waiting on His return. We're waiting for Him to rescue us from this place. 
the longer I live, and I think I've said this since I've been here, but I, the longer I live, this, the sooner I want the Lord to come back. I used to think as a kid, Lord, don't come back today because I, I want to play at the park, you know, <laughs> like playing at the park would somehow be better, you know, than the return of the Lord. But we do think of that way sometimes. There's things I want to do, there's things I want to enjoy, but I'm telling you, I know I'm just 39. I'm just saying, man, if he came back before I got done, that'd be all right. It'd be all right with me. And sometimes we can get impatient in the time we spend here waiting. And it's one thing to have patience. It's one thing to wait. Here, here's the question. How are we waiting? Um, I'm trying to get to the, try to get to the point quick here. Um, when we talk about this word hope, because it says to have a patience of hope. Hope, biblical hope, is different than worldly hope. All right. Um, worldly hope is very much um, that lottery sort of hope. It's just kind of throwing in the lot and hoping, crossing our fingers, hoping that things come out okay. And most of the world, this is very scary, but most of the world, that's where they pin their salvation in some sort of hope. I, I just hope when I get there that my good will outweigh my bad. And guess what? Not one winner in that contest. It just doesn't work. But that's worldly hope. You know, I, I understand worldly hope because, um, well, I thought this would be a good example. I apologize right now, but I'm a Cowboys fan. Every year, every year, this is our year. Every year for 26 years or whatever, this is the one. Listen, worldly hope, sorry. I've been let down too many times. Zero assurance in that hope. But a biblical hope is different, okay? Biblical hope is a joyful, confident expectation of what is to come. So now that I'm saved, and I've, I've been saved by Jesus Christ, He's He's paid the penalty for me. I know my way is paid. I know that he's forgiven me. And so my hope now is not, oh, I hope I make it into heaven. My hope is this. No, one day I'm going to go to heaven. How do I know that? Because he's, he's paid the way. The hope, the, the hope that I have is, is confident assurance that, no, one day it will be. It's just like all the prophecy in the scriptures. We, we understand that these things are not things that may or may not happen. No, they're going to happen, by the way, whether we believe them or not. Think about some of the, you know, I like to use biblical characters as examples. So think about Gideon. The first message I ever preached in my life, I forget, I was probably a junior high age, and I was asked to preach at a youth service and uh, scared to death. And uh, so I, I wrote a message on Gideon, um, about 14 pages of handwritten notes, and I preached for about four and a half minutes. I don't even know how I read that. But love Gideon. You know, Gideon, God comes to Gideon, and uh, the Midianites are all, you know, oppressing them. And so they're hiding their wheat, and they're hiding. So he's threshing wheat at the wine press, which you don't do. You thresh wheat somewhere else. But he's at the wine press. He's hiding. He's, he's well, he's not showing bravery. But God comes to him and says, thou mighty man of valor. You know, and he goes, you know. Someone else here, it must not be me, but it was him. And, and the Lord used him. But it's funny, Gideon was very nervous about it. You remember he threw out the fleece? Lord, if this is really you, you know, and he throws out the fleece, let there be dew on the fleece, not on the ground. You know the story. And then he wakes up and he goes, wait a minute. What if it's that way every day? So he goes back to the Lord. Okay, Lord, don't get mad. But if, if it's that way, then today, just let the dew be on the ground and not the fleece. He, he puts that, you know, he's, te he's testing the Lord. He, he doesn't have belief. But, but what if Gideon, what if Gideon, what if he could have read the Bible account that I get to read before it ever happened? You know, what if he got to read Judges 6, 7, and 8, he, and he knew that, you know, they're going to go into battle with pitchers and lamps. Oh, that's exciting. And that the enemy were going to slay themselves because God was going to have the victory. If he would have read and understood and known the end before he even started, I don't think he would have ever needed that fleece. And here's what I'm saying as a Christian person, uh, you know, we do know the end of our story. We don't know how everything's going to happen here on this earth, but we know the end of our story. The Lord's already told us we have things to be expecting and we have 
We, we can have a confidence that one day I will be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. And all the troubles and all the problems of this life and all the difficulties that, that we go through day in and day out, we think they're so big here. When we get there, they'll be just a flash in the pan of a memory. You know, we live here 70, 80, 90 years, sometimes longer. Eternity, folks, eternity with God. A hundred years is nothing. I mean, to God, it's just that. If the disciples, we talked about the disciples this week, if they could have seen that the Lord is going to stand up and rebuke the storm, I mean, how would their confidence have been different in that boat? So let's just illustrate. I'm just going to help us illustrate this, and then we're going to close. <clears throat> I'm going to throw out some words. See, normally I, I, I thought when I was we put the lesson together, the message together, um, I have these cards that have these words on them. I was going to have people hold them, but um, those are in my office back in Austin. So I'm just going to throw out some words to you. And, and I want you to pick, okay? You, you decide what best illustrates your walk with the Lord. What, what, what illustrates your waiting? Because we're all waiting. Okay, so here's some words. Confidence. Nervousness. Contentment. Do they describe you? Worry. Peace. Anxiousness. Calm. What describes your day? Let me say it like this. When you get bad news, what best described? A stirring of the heart. Or a confident expectation. You know, if you put yourself on one side or the other of that fence, you'll know which way you're waiting. Whether you're waiting with worldly hope or biblical hope. So the, the church at Thessalonica, and we're just going to wrap it up here. They had a work of faith. The things that they were doing there, they were doing them for the purpose uh, and with the intention that God would come through on his side of the bargain and do something in their midst. They, they believed in that. They labored. They were willing to give of themselves. And like Paul says in another passage, he was willing to be spent or to spend and be spent. Why? They were willing because it was that Jesus Christ was worth that to them. A labor of love. And as they waited, whatever it was, whether they were waiting on Paul to write him a letter, whether they were waiting to get through the trial, or whether they're waiting for, as verse 10 says, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, they waited with a confident expectation, with peace, contentment, calmness. Why? Because they had a patience of biblical hope. And so if we want to have a church that is successful in the ministry, that persists through difficult times, we've got to have work. It just takes work. It takes labor. It takes patience. But we cannot do those things without faith, love, and hope. It's got to be a part of it. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful for the the your word lord and thankful for the passage that explains lord what, what a church is and i think of all the different churches in the scripture there are several that stand out but thessalonica has got to be one of the most effectual ministries described in the book and so lord help us to understand the secret and really it's no secret you've written it down for us but help us understand the elements necessary lord that lord you we can't please you without faith it's impossible. And uh, Lord, we, we must be constrained by your love. And, and Lord, help us to wait with a confident expectation of your return and your deliverance. Father, we continue to pray, uh, Lord, just for this church and um, Lord, in their seeking of a pastor, all the different situations in the meantime. Lord, I just know your hand is over all of it. And I pray that you'd be with this church and uh, be with our family. 
Lord, we, we ask for your will to be made clear, and uh, that's all. Lord, we pray you dismiss us tonight, uh, this afternoon, with your love. And I just pray as we go out from this place that we be salt and light uh, wherever it is that we go, and that you would help us. And we'll ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.